about today is taking a stand. Taking a stand for our faith. Taking a stand for our walk. Taking a stand for Jesus. Amen? Amen. And um, I just want to start off. I had this pastor got with me a couple months ago. And it's like, hey, could you speak on Memorial Day weekend? I was like, yeah, that's fine. And a couple times before, he's given me a couple, you know, maybe three weeks a month. I don't know. I don't want to shortchange him. So it was less than two months. Let's just put it that way. And, um, you know, so I was going over this, and I had this finished, and I was going over it and going over it and going over it. And it, the, the message that I have can go different ways. And last night, I, I had stayed up till like midnight going over it, make sure it's all good. And I had my scriptures in here on Thursday. I came to practice, got them all loaded up in there. And then last night, about 3, well, this morning at 3.30, I woke up, and the Lord wants to do something different. Amen. And, um, you know, so I'll be honest with you. I got this to together this morning. Some of it is old. Some of it is new. But it's what God wants. Amen. Amen. So we're going to go with that today because that's what we need to do. We need to be obedient to him at all times, right. no matter what. When we are weak, he is strong. Amen. So we're going to go through. So please, if I'm looking at my notes a little more than usual, it's because, um, you know, haven't gone over this, but for... 30 minutes. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, um, Dylan. If you could go with Matthew 16, 24 this morning, we'll start off. Everybody see it okay? And then everybody go ahead. And Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning and I just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord. I thank you for everyone here today. I pray that you um, have your way among us, Lord, among our hearts, Father. And I pray that you reveal to us, Lord, if there's anything in our life that is not in line with you. But I pray that you um, only you is heard, our, is heard today through my mouth, Lord. Anoint my lips. Let nothing of me come out of me except you and your glory and your goodness and your love, Father, Lord. I pray that Anybody here who is blind you today, that you open their eyes and you let them see you for the first time. And anybody who has not heard, give them ears to hear today, Lord. Just, I give this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before I um, start, I want to take a second and I want to make notice of the young men and women who give their life for this country, for your freedom, for my freedom. Each and every day, they're still doing it as we speak right now. They are not at home with their families. There's lots of families this weekend. I know a lot of people look at it as a three-day vacation. They don't have to work. They can go party. They can do whatever they want. But when the reality is, there's men and women who gave their life for us, for our freedom, for us to be able to be here today and worship our Lord freely today. So I just want to take a second and just honor them. says that there's no greater love than he who laid down his life for his friend. Amen. And that's what them young men and women do. So I just, I pray um, pray this morning for comfort for the families, Lord. I pray for um, that you just give them peace in their heart. I know at this time of the year, every year comes along and, and they have memories of the precious time that they had with their loved ones, whether it be a son, whether it be a daughter, whether it be a dad or an aunt or an uncle, or whatever it may be. Lord, we just lift these families up to you right now, Lord, and all. We just give you all the glory and just pray that you give them peace and comfort in their time of need. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this morning, I want to talk about, again, taking a stand. And you put that scripture back up there, please. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If anybody here has been told that it will not cost you nothing to follow Jesus, you have been lied to. Because it will cost you everything to follow Jesus. If you're going to follow him the way that he wants you to follow him, the way that he has called you to follow him, the way that his word tells you to follow him, it is going to cost you your life. You're going to, Just like he laid his life down for us, we are to lay our life down to him. Any desires that we have are no longer our desires, but we replace them with his desires. 
any want that we have, if it is not aligned with his word, is not a want that we need anymore. Anything that we want to do, anything that we're after, every single place that we go or want to go, we have to run it by him and pray to him and, and seek his advice and seek his guidance and make sure that it is his will. Because if we're not in his will, then we are off his path. We are not following him. We are very slowly, sometimes quickly, depending on what we're doing, but we are getting off that path and we're going our own way. There's a whole new generation of Christians today that are coming up believing that it is possible to accept Christ without forsaking the world. And that is the farthest thing that Jesus died for us for. He told us that you have to forsake all. You have to forsake your father, your mother, possibly, possibly um, your family. There's a cost in following him. There's a price to pay with your life. We find ourselves as Christians always asking, oh, maybe I'm the only one, but we're always asking ourselves, how far can I go and still be considered a Christian? Does anybody ask themselves that? And just, you know, test the waters a little bit. How, what's too far? You know, am I still in his path? Am I still in his will? Or am I really drifting off? Some people don't care and they just live how they want to live. We're not, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about people who have called on the name of the Lord. People that said, Lord, I'll follow you. I'll forsake all. And they question and they ask themselves, how far can I go? And really, we need to be asking ourselves, how holy can I be? To a mighty God who loves me and has given everything to me. We need to ask ourselves that. Why do we always find ourselves covering up our disobedient tracks? We're always... Um, I'm not saying we have to lie, but sometimes we do. To, to cover up what we're in or what sin we're in or what we're doing. We don't want anybody to know about it. And we have to cover that up by going around the truth at times. Um, when we're challenged by God's high standards, we as Christians have become too comforted in the fact that we don't stand out from everybody else in the world. I don't look any different than people in the workplace, and we've become comfortable with that. And that very thing is troubling because we don't look any different than non-Christians. At whatsoever at times in our lives. Yeah. And we really need to check our walk. We're supposed to be a light to those in need of the light. That's right. We're supposed to show him the physician. And if we are partaking in some of the things that they are doing or saying or gossiping about, then we are not shining that light. Amen. Mm -hmm. Corinthians, second Corinthians says, Paul writes, Come out from among them and be separate. We find ourselves a lot of the time sharing and, and participating in the same activities, listening to the same music that we shouldn't be listening to, telling the same jokes that we shouldn't be talking about, the same dirty jokes, running somebody down, gossiping about somebody. And we, we've become so comfortable with it that it's become just part of our nature anymore. And, and we need to ask ourselves, why is that so? Why, why is that okay in my walk? If I say that I love the Lord and I say that I'm following Him, then why do I do that? I ask myself that. I, know I mess up at work sometimes. I find myself too deep in a conversation and I didn't really realize it until I'm already there. And, yeah. and um, sometimes I just have to walk away. And, but I think we all have to to just be aware of that and, and not let us let, let it take root in us and be come to the point where it just comes automatic for us, where we don't even realize we're doing it. Holy Spirit reveals that to us as we're as we are in it and talking and in the conversations. You feel that little tug on you saying, "No, you shouldn't be doing that." And you have to listen to Him, learn how to listen, and be obedient to Him. True. We've um, partaken in some of us share and participate and, and agree in premarital sex with with people who are not married. We it's the way of the world, and we just there's no problem with it. People, even Christians, will partake in that today. They partake in um, living together before they're married. Now, I'm sorry if I offend anybody in here today, but this is the word of God. Yeah, he says we're not supposed to do that. I'm not, I don't know anybody. I don't know anything that's going on. So it's not to anybody in particular, but 
the acceptance of gay marriage. We have, you know, you can love the person who is in that, but you don't condone what they're doing, and you don't accept it, and you don't um, encourage it. If they ask you a question about it, or you tell them what God says about it. Our standards have become mixed and blurred. Our guardrails are down, and we have no safe boundaries anymore. When, we're, when you're driving on the road, you have guardrails up. You feel a little safer than if it was a huge cliff and there was no guardrails, and you're just driving along this narrow, thin road. That's what it's like when we're not in the will of God, and, and we're taking a risk where if you go off the road, it can lead to death. Sin leads to death, it says in the Bible. So we need to be careful with that. Matthew 5, it says, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Again, we are the, the light. We are his light. He is in us. We are shining in the darkness. We are to be a light to those in the darkness. We are to stand out. Even if that is an inconvenience to us. Even if people are going to look down on us and make fun of us. It says in the Bible you will be persecuted if you take a stand and follow me. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4 says, But even our gospel is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Who are they talking about there? Talking about the enemy. Amen. He has blinded. The, the eyes and the minds of those who are perishing, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. When people are walking around in sin, we always ask ourselves, we're always like, why are they doing that? Can't they see that this is not good? Why are they living that way? They're living that way because they're in darkness. Right. They do not right. see it. They are blind to it, completely right. blind. They do not see it. The enemy has pulled a veil over them. And they cannot see anything but that darkness. When you walk, if they're in a room and it's complete darkness, and you have Jesus in you, and you walk into the room, and your light starts to shine out for all to see, and it shines on them, and they see the love that you have for them, even though you don't really know them. They see that you care about them. They see that something's going on in you. They notice something different. Something's Jesus. And once that light gets on them, it starts to expose what where they're living, what they're living in, what sin they're in. It starts when they start to think about it. It starts to become um, where they get these little thoughts in their head. People say it's conscience, conscience, but it's God speaking to them, saying, "No, you shouldn't be doing that right now." He starts to speak to their heart. If we're not a light to the world, then nobody is going to change. They're going to stay where they're at, falling, and. Um, it is just, it's our job. The Lord says to go out and preach the gospel. Save the lost. That is what we're called to do. We're not called to come in here in a building and be comfy and raise our hand and say amen. Yes, we need to worship our Savior. Yes. We need to lift Him up. But there comes a time where we need to go out and we need to show the world, a broken world, who our joy is in. Yes, amen. amen. We wonder why this next generation is struggling because of the example that we have set as parents and as adults to our kids, what our grandparents possibly, or I don't know where it is in your family or what it is, but we see all these youth and we're like, why are they so disrespectful? Why don't they listen? Why, you know, I, I've never talked down to my mom, but I can remember, I don't know. She's like, <laughs> I knew better. There is a sense of respect, the sense of you know, love, obviously. But they're teenagers today. I mean, I hear them. I hear it in my own house sometimes. I hear it through other people um, that, that kids are speaking to them. And there's so much disrespect that goes to the mom and dad. And, it's, and you know, the word says, honor your father and your mother. All you kids, your parents have the best interest in mind for you. They love you. They want the best for you. They want, they want to protect you. They want to keep you from doing what they did and yep. what they messed up on. So you don't have to go down them same traps and them same paths. Yes. And you don't have to mess around with that. It's, it's just it's it's a never end. It's 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 an end to nothing. You're not going anywhere. You're going to waste the same amount of time that I wasted on, them and that 
you guys waste time. And we, and we just have to set that example. We can't tell our kids not to do something and then while we're doing it. Right. You know, we can't tell our kids not to smoke and we're smoking. We can't tell our kids not to drink. I used to tell my kids not to drink all the time. And here I am drinking in front of them. And it's a horrible, and you can't stand on that. There's nothing you can do. Amen. But now that I, the Lord had delivered me from that, I can tell them not to do that. Don't drink. I went down that road. It's a horrible dark path. It leads to nothing. And just, I'm saving you years of grief and years of yep. torment and yep. years of self-doubt and running yourself down and wondering why you're Amen. worthless, wondering why you're useless. It just still saves you so much. And, yes. and we have to show our kids, not tell them. We need to show them. Amen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Our slack and our standards is costing us our witness to this world. Yep. Each and every day. That's right. Yep. Proverbs 16, 25, please. There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. If we're not on God's path and we are doing things our way, we do not consult him, we do not talk to him, we do not read the word, we do not look and see what his word says about what we're doing, it leads to death. Amen. If you're going to do things your way, you are 100% not going on his path because you have not listened to the Lord and you haven't listened to his voice. When, we have, when you have instability in one part of your walk with God, it affects your strength in other parts. Yep. You can be really strong in something and so strong-willed with something. But if you have a little weakness over here and you let the enemy in, he will pull you away from where you were so strong and the strength that you had. There might be a strength that you have for someone that God is going to use you to help them, to deliver them, to strengthen them, to comfort them. And if you allow the enemy to get in and to wreak havoc in you, it will pull you away from that. And not only are you backsliding, but you might be saving, you might be, um, yeah, someone else is not going to have the benefit of being delivered from whatever it is that you are supposed to be helping out with. Amen? Amen. And we need to be aware of that. So when we're comfortable blending in with the world and not standing out, it's showing others that we are no different at times from non-believers. John 12, 46. Dylan, please. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. You find out, I know I have a note here on that. The Greek word abide here is, I believe it's pronounced meno, and it means to stay. So if you take that scripture, got it up there, okay. It says, whoever believes in me should not stay in darkness, should not continue in darkness, should not dwell in darkness, should not remain in darkness, and should not be present in darkness. We're going to slip up, we're going to fall, but what's the Lord say? Don't stay there. Don't stay there. He says, nor do I condemn you. I, you know, the lady um, caught in the act of adultery. He said, go and sin no more. And that's what, you know, we can't, yes, we mess up, but we can't get down on ourselves to the point where we allow ourselves to stay there. Yeah, right. And to just, and be caught there and stuck there. And actually we end up in a worse state than what we were, worse word. No. No. I'm going to ask her a couple times. I was I was glad she was here today. You are going to be worse off than you were before. Something in me said that wasn't right. And then when I looked at her, I knew it wasn't right. Some people believe that it's the big things in life, the big sins that cause us to stumble. But more often than not, it's the little minor ones. It's the small ones that shake us the most. Um, I don't know if everybody in here is casting crowns slow fade. Yes. That song, it's that song is so true. Yes. You know, somebody who an, uh, a marriage that was in an affair and ended in divorce did not just start off right there and there it was. It started off with little things that led up to it. Right. Little things, and I'm not. And there's millions of other um, examples that I could give. 
A.W. Tozer said one compromise here and another there, and soon enough, the so-called Christian and the man of this world look exactly the same. Yeah. When we start to compromise, when we start to, um, we can even be in the Word of God every day and still compromise if we're not really watching what we're doing. Yeah. Um, an example, if, if your home is robbed, the robber does not need every single window, every single door, Every single latch unlocked. All he needs is one opening. Yeah. He needs one door, one screen, one window, one whatever. One little opening, and he has access to everything that you have. The same is with the enemy, Satan. Yeah. When you give him one little thing that you don't think is that big, you're focused on these big things. Now I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. But then yeah. there's all these little things that we like, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal. But we allow the enemy to come in. He gets his foot in there. And he starts, like we said, the strong points where you're strong in start to fade away and start to become weak as you start to, as you start to lose control. That can be true in your marriage. It can be true in your thought life. So many different areas that that, that, that is true. And we, we compromise one area. Yeah. Ephesians 4.27, the Amplified, reads... Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. Give no opportunity to him at all. You guys believe that Judas loved Jesus? Anybody in this room believe that? I know that we focus on what he did to Jesus, but it did say in the Bible that he, that the Lord said, if you're going to follow me, you need to forsake all. So, and Judas was following him. Judas was walking behind him. Judas was following him to all these places. So, I mean, he had to forsake his family. He had to forsake those loved ones with him. And while he was being persecuted, while Jesus was constantly being accused, Judas was with him. He was one of the 12 that was there standing and, and getting talked to. Judas cast out demons. He healed the sick and he preached the gospel. And you believe that? Yeah. It says in the Bible that he sent out 12. He didn't send out 11. Two by two. Judas was going around. They went and they, if they were received, they stayed at the house and they preached the word of God. And if they weren't, they wiped the dust off their feet and they moved on. Yeah. So he was walking with Jesus. Um, he got tripped up and he let one little compromise from money yeah. come into his life, come into his heart. And the enemy came in and it caused him to stumble. Yeah. One little spot. James 2.10, Dylan, please. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point he is guilty of all. We tend to categorize sin. This sin's here, this sin's down here. It's not that big. When God sees sin, he sees it. It's even scales. It's all the same. He looks at it as, as sin. It's against him. Um, We are all going to stand before him and be judged on judgment day. Whether we believe in him, whether we don't believe in him, whether you follow him, whether you don't. He does not put somebody who follows him over here and say, well, you knew the word, you read the word of God, you were instructed, you knew how to follow me, and you chose not to, so you're going to be judged this way. And this person over here who never, never ever said, they never confessed me on their tongue, they never followed me, so they're going to have less judgment. No, we're all going to stand before him. We're all going to give an account for every word that we speak, for every thought that we have, for everything that we do. We're going to give an account to that. I don't know about you, but that frightens me at times. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. If you stand before the Lord and you confess your sin to him and repent and turn away, he remembers it no longer. Right. As far as the east is to the west, you're going to stand before him and he will not remember that no more. So I'm not trying to get, don't get hung up on that stuff. Is it once, that's a whole other sermon, forgiving yourself when God's already forgiven you. Yeah. Amen. Yes. But we just need to remember that um, all sin is sin in God's eyes. There's no levels to it. I'm going to give an example of obedience in the Bible from 2 Chronicles 34. Um, Israel had a king, Josiah. He was eight years old when he became king. Imagine having a king. 
I know some of you are probably like, man, I'd take an eight-year-old over Trump or Hillary. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> we won't get into that today. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> he was eight years old, and, and his father and his grandfather did not follow God. They did not. They worshipped other gods. They were not following him. And he, at a young age, wanted to seek the God that David loved and cherished. So he started to seek out who this God is. And everything that was in, that was opposite of what that was, any, any other God that people were worshiping, he started to tear down the high places. And they were doing a large-scale renovation of the temple. And a high priest found the book of the law that was lost for a long time. And they brought it to him and they read it to him. And when he realized their failure to live up to God's standards, go to 2 Chronicles 34, 21. Please. He says, go and quarrel with the Lord for me. And for those who are left in Israel, in Judea, in Judah, sorry, concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all, everybody say all, all, all that was written in this book. So he went and he got everybody together and he brought them all together. King Josiah could have used the excuse, well, my father did it, my grandfather did it, everybody before him did it, so...